as we go through this lesson, I'm going to be talking about some of the things we talked about last week. Uh, but I want to start with the book that was written in eight, uh, 1989, two theologians, Stanley Hauerwas and um, William Willimon, kind of blew up the, the evangelical or in conservative type Protestant churches with an amazing book, a little book called Resident Aliens. Now, aliens are often in the news, and we're not talking about from outer space, we're talking about people who cross borders, but that's not what they're talking about. It is about the fact that we are aliens, and we are supposed to realize our alien status as citizens of heaven while being on this earth. They take this title uh, from Philippians, but also from the first two chapters of 1 Peter, where we are described as saints, we'll come back to that, priest, we'll come back to that, aliens, and we'll come back to that. Saints, what is a saint? Well, in some churches, only some people are saints, and they have to go through this process, and then the ones that are given the power to beatify them, make them saints. In scripture, all people who follow Jesus are saints. All of us. You're a saint. That's pretty cool. But what does it mean to be a saint? Saint comes from the word sanctified. It means set apart for a particular purpose. So, for example, I put on this sweater today. The, I wear this sweater when I'm working, uh, when I'm doing something like this, or I'll wear clothes like this. Uh, I have a very limited color palette uh, because that way it, it matches. I can go in in the dark and, and I'm, I'm pretty safe when I come out. And I, it doesn't change because I'm over 40 and men over 40 at some time walk into their closet and say, oh, that's what I'm wearing the rest of my life right there. And it's uh, you know, extra points if it embarrasses the kids. So <laughs> however, if I am uh, changing the oil in my car, or if I'm digging a ditch in the backyard, I won't wear this. Why? This is set apart for another purpose. When something is set apart for another purpose, it is sanctified. So, you know, it's kind of like when, when my wife bakes a pie or a cake. I know there must be a church function or somebody's sick. And, and she will tell me, I'll even ask, is that for us? It's, it's never. And, and she'll say, don't eat that. That is for... It has been sanctified. You are sanctified. You're not supposed to look like, be like, sound like, or think like the people around you. You're set apart for something else. You're also a priest. Priests are those who communicate to people on God's behalf and who communicate to God on people's behalf. They are in between. In the Christian realm, you don't need somebody standing between you and God. All people who want to talk to God and come to God through Christ are priests. They can directly speak to people about God and for God, and they can directly speak to God. And that's wonderful. They're not a separate class of people. They're all of the believers. And we are aliens, and then we don't really belong here. I brought this up uh, probably a year or so ago, but my wife and I were driving out to Colorado and we stopped in Lawrence, Kansas. It's a university town. We went downtown to find something to eat and a nice restaurant we found there. Big windows looking out upon the people. And everybody that passed us, I mean, everybody was either a student or student adjacent. And all of them had weird hair and weird t-shirts and weird things stapled in them or tattoos or something all of them, and that's the key, because after a while, we look and look, and I looked over at my wife, and I said, we're the weirdos. It's not them. They're normal. This is perfectly normal. We're the aliens here. It's rather like the time only lasted two seconds, but I'll never forget the, the you idiot that came into my head right after when I landed at Charles de Gaulle Airport at 17. Uh, just outside of Paris, and as we were taxiing by the parking lot, which you used to be able to do, I'm looking around going, wow, they have lots of foreign cars here. No, they don't. Those are French cars. You can tell, because most of them didn't make it to the exit. But um, 
I, I had a French car. I had his two-cylinder. A two-cylinder, 27 horsepower. Oh, yeah. Zero to 60 by Thursday, uh, usually. <laughs> um, it was embarrassing when birds passed you, but um, uh, I actually loved that car. If I could have it over here, I would. Anyway, we are supposed to feel out of place on earth. Now, we looked at the, how the Apostles' Doctrine transformed the lives of the saints in Acts chapter 2. That was, was dramatic, how they had everything in common, how nobody had any needs. But this week, we're going to spend a little bit more time on that, because the fact is, it is very, very hard to, tra- to transform the concept in our heart of our possessions, our time, our lives. Paul tells us to redeem the time, and Mary Alice did exactly that in her illustration. The time was not going well. Our plans fell through. Our desire for dinner is going sideways. You know, our desire for this. But they redeemed it by not acting like anybody else would. But instead being an alien, a stranger, doing what others would not do. And by the way, we did get quite a few stories and not nearly as many as I wanted, but that's the way that always works. Um, but many of them had to do with servers. And I think one of the reasons is servers is one of the easiest group of people to bless because they're right there, they're hassled, they are harried, and this is an opportunity. There's always a line, tip, which means, will you bless this person? Really, that's what I mean. It's, it really means in America, we're not going to pay them. Would you pay them? And so uh, I know there are people who just don't like tipping. You know, you don't have to bless the person. If you cannot bless the person, don't go out to eat. Uh, you're, you're supposed to be blessing people. We're different. Everything in our culture argues against that. Your possessions are yours. Your desires are yours. It's your time, your life. Live your best. And God says, pick up your cross and walk through there. How different is that? But we we don't tend to talk about that much. But they did. One of the earliest writings about the Christian life and the attitude of Christians toward life is uh, the the Didache, or it's D-I-D-A-C-H-E. And Didache is how most people pronounce it. It's It's a very fascinating document. And there's a line in it. Hear this. Do not hold your hands open for receiving, but closed for giving. Now, this is not a sermon on giving. This is a sermon on being. Because this did not, if you read further in, in, in the Didache, this did not refer just to possessions or goods, but to love and time. Don't be the people who always have to receive love, but do not give it back. Do not be the people who always receive, but don't give. Whenever I ran a counseling practice, the hardest people to work with were those that were immersed in self-pity because they already had everything they wanted. No matter what room they walked into, they could just sit, look, sigh, and get all of the attention, all of the swarm, and never give anything back. And so trying to... Trying to help somebody be well by not getting everything they've always gotten was brutal. Don't be even a little bit like that. But instead, think, how can I give more than I'm receiving? We always raised our kids to, say, to be the most polite people in the room. And they're teaching their kids that as well. And there are times we've had notable failures. We had a neighbor in, in Colorado. There was nothing we could do. He was going to get, he was going to be nicer to us. Even when a, literally an ambulance arrived at their house, I go over, a grandchild is taken with breathing issues. Parents are with them. There's no room for the grandparents. So they're sitting on the steps. The grandparents were our neighbors. And I said, how can I pray for you? How can I work for you? And he said, you know, it's, it's, we understand and we believe it's going to be all right. What can we do for you guys? We hadn't seen you in a while. I'm going, not now, Niels. We're supposed to be blessing, but it was, it was brutal. Um, and I, I've, I've met a couple of other people like that, that they just, and I'm going, aliens and strangers. That's who they are, resident aliens in this world. Why would they have to do all of this? Well, God said to do it, obviously, but that's, 
he didn't actually say to do it in those sermons. They just naturally did it because they realized we are no longer a part of the community of the world. We are now a part of the community of faith. Do you remember? The Jewish community of faith had been prepared for 1,500 years. They were ready when Jesus came. But he warned them that the world will not be prepared from the moment I die. From there on, it's a difficult world. Read John chapter 17 in his prayer to his father. And he says, the world I'm sending them into is not the same. And they understood that. So what do you do? Well, you can join the community of faith, which they really did. They joined the Jews in that. And they were Jews and then Jesus and Christians. And that was all one blend. But all of that was a dynamic moving force. And they realized as we take it from this world to that world, from uh, wherever you are right now, out your front door, you're going to enter an unprepared community. And you are going to be weird to them. You're going to be strange to them. We have to get an attitude adjustment. We need to rebuild a community that is prepared to be different from our unprepared and hostile world. Clement of Alexandria, one of the earliest leaders of the church, wrote this, and it's a rather long quote, so I'll try to not make it boring. For he who holds possessions as the gifts of God and knows that he possesses them more for the sake of the brothers than his own and is superior to the possession of them, not the slave of the things he possesses, and does not carry them about in his soul and bind and circumscribe his life within them, but is ever laboring at some divine work and is able with cheerful mind to bear their removal equally with their abundance. Well, that's just weird. But that's who we are now. We are the different people. I've been, I've been blessed to travel a lot of the world. And there are times where, especially when I listen, I've not been to Asia, but when I listen to Asian languages, it is so different from the Romance languages of you know, French and Latin and, and Spanish and like, that I find myself wanting to say, but I'm, I'm, I'm a better man than that, stop it, those aren't real words. That cannot be real words. You're having us on. But no, I need to be the kind of person that what I say and what I do sounds as odd to people as that. Not bizarre for bizarre's sake. That's easy. Anybody can be bizarre for bizarre's sake. I could come up here in a clown costume. Easy. But to be different for Christ as one who is not like this world that's what we're called to. One early Christian stated it more succinctly in a letter that I've quoted several times. We do not say great things. We live them. That's so important. And I want to give you an example of this. Now, this is an American issue. And I know we have people, they've checked in from, from all over. But it's il illustrative of the kind of people we are when we're resident aliens, if you will hold with me just a moment. And I'll make this with as few details as possible. There is a state which has had a change of administration, new governor, new attorney general, all of that. And they ran on and have declared that one of the big things they're going to do is stop letting prisoners out of prison even 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years after a crime has been committed, even if they were perfect in prison, which is very difficult to do. And they're going to start killing people on death row, which they had not done for a long time. And they passed a bill this last week, maybe two weeks now, that uh, said we can kill them this way, this way, this way, and started listing the ways. We have 66 men in one of those prisons in that state. We have others in other prisons there. We rarely talk about them because we talk about the big one, the state one. We go down to visit them. More than one's on death row. And they've been told, um, we're starting the process, the machine, and it could be you. I talked to one of them this week. 
Well, you can't call them, but they can call you if they have money in an account, and it's, we set that up. As I saw the, the number, I was thinking, what's, how's, how's Bobby going to handle it? We're just doing first name. How's, how's he d- doing? Because he's always told me, I'll, I'll be free again, and I'm going to go to this, uh, you know, this seminary, and he's told me he's going to preach with me on this soundstage. And he's just as convinced as he could be. And, and I've met with him, I don't know how many times now. He stays that way. So I'm going, how's Bobby doing? So he called me and he always starts it the same way. Hey there, man of God. And I always say, hey, Bobby, how are you doing? And he always responds, I'm blessed. How are you? Well, I always tell him aches and pains. I don't, I don't have that, you know, I'm blessed thing. But I talked to him and I said, how are you doing? And he goes, I'm fine. And I said, Bobby, under these conditions, what's going through your head? And he laughed. And he said, you can't threaten me with heaven. (laughs) Now that's not normal. That's not regular. So I pushed him. Because he used to be a therapist. It's what we do talked a little bit more about this. And I said, but you've always said you're going to be free. And he says, uh, you know, Pastor, you put me on the moon, I'm free. You put me outside these bars, I'm free. You put me in these bars, I'm free. Because I'm in Christ, I'm free. It doesn't matter what they do to me. I'm free. We talked like that for a while. His time ran out, he called me back. <laughs> and he talked until we were actually done talking. That's never happened with me and, and Bobby. Where he, we both said, well, that's it. Because Bobby likes to talk. But we, we talked and we ended up saying, love you. Trying to set up a visit with him. Prison's dragging its feet. We'll see if, what we can do. But Bobby is a resident alien. They think they have him on death row. They think when and if that day comes that they can take his life. They don't know him. They don't know the country in which he is a citizen. For as scripture says, we're no longer here. We're resident aliens. We are citizens of heaven. That's a different place. So Acts chapter 2, 42 through 47, where they had all things in common and they met with each other in the homes. Nobody had needs if they had the ability to share. That's not an aberration. That's normal. In Philippians 4.19, the scripture says, and my God will meet all of your needs according to the grace of Jesus Christ. Well, Matthew chapter 25, you heard it, read here. On the day of judgment, Jesus isn't going to say, what church did you go to? What did you believe? Did you, you know, what did you think about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit? You know, how'd, you, you, how'd you do your baptism? He does not, he's not going to say that. I know because in Matthew 25, he says what he will say. And that way he's going to look at us and people like Adam Nettesheim who think they're full of faults and such. But I got to tell you, I'm still the champion on that one, Adam. At the best, you're number two. And he's going to look at us and he's going to say, Thank you for feeding me, clothing me, giving me something to drink, visiting me in prison. And maybe somebody up there is going to be as idiotic as a person in chapter 25 that will go, no, that wasn't us. Don't, do not blow the curve. Don't be the kid that as the teacher is dismissing, say, weren't we supposed to have a test today? Don't be that kid. And Jesus is going to say, as much as you did it, to any of these, you did it to me. So that $17 went to Jesus. So the money that you send us, that we send to Grace Works, or we send up to Lifeline in Northeast Missouri, or we send to uh, One Gen Away, or we send to the veterans in the homeless shelters in, um, in New Jersey, or any of these other places, that money's given to Jesus. We don't look upon it as our money. We don't sit on it. It's Jesus's. Let's get it out there to Matthew 25 it, to Acts 2 it. Put it to work. Luke chapter 6 is all about, in his version of the Sermon on the Mount, giving to others 
and relying upon God to give to us. We don't rely upon others to give. We'll give and rely upon God to take care of us. I can remember talking to a church once. I used to do a lot of work with churches, going around helping them leadership and making shifts and changes. And in one, they, they showed me the bank account, and it was a whole lot of money. Um, I won't reveal it because that's not mine to do. It's a ton of money. And I said, what's the plan here? And they said, well, that's, we're, that's in, you know, for, for a rainy day. I'm going, last rainy day that big, we had to put animals in a boat. <laughs> but when Jesus comes back, are you going to say, we saved the money for you. What are you going to do with this? Walk with me through Romans 12. Romans 12 would be a good place for you to play around in this week. It is, it's an amazing about how we are to live now in this new community, now that we have been naturalized into the family, adopted into the family, naturalized into the kingdom of God. We can go down and pick so many different verses, but in verse 8, uh, it's if encouraged, then give encouragement. If your gift is giving, then give generously. If it's leading, do it diligently. If it's showing mercy, do it cheerfully. The list of gifts in Romans 12, uh, 1 Corinthians 12, and elsewhere in Scripture never have the gift of judgment or criticism. Never. Just a thought. You can go down, love must be sincere in verse 9. Love each other warmly and be eager to open your home to strangers. Uh, show respect to each other, verses 10, verses 13. Have the same concern for everybody. Don't pick sides, but ha allow yourself to take humble duties, verse 16. Don't live inside your head with revenge or power fantasies, but defeat evil by doing good, verses 18 through 21. It's really a how-to book. It, it needs, it's like a citizen's manual. Now that you're a citizen, here are your responsibilities. Now, in America, uh, I don't remember this ever being done in Britain, but I haven't lived forever, so I can be corrected. In America, for the longest time, in grade school, they would start teaching you something called civics, where you would learn how the government works, and you as a citizen, and what your responsibility, and they would teach it again in middle school, and they'd teach it in high school, that has pretty much gone away, but not for us. For the kingdom of heaven, we have civics. Romans 12 is a good chapter for it. James tells us something a, a little harsh. James is a cosmic dentist. I love my dentist, good guy. Um, he didn't like hurting anybody. Fact is, if you go to the dentist, you're going to get hurt. Somehow, some way. They'll say, this will help numb you so you won't have pain. And how they numb you hurts. It's, it's not their fault. You know, they're doing their best for you. James is a cosmic dentist. You need to, you, you gotta go. But you're gonna hurt somewhere before you leave him. And in James chapter 2, starting at verse 12, speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. So don't be afraid. Be lavish in what you do. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who's not been merciful. Oh, there's the, there's, the, there's the shot. Be merciful because if you're not, you don't get mercy. Okay. Mercy triumphs over judgment. <laughs> that, let's put that on the outside of our churches if you go to a brick and mortar. Mercy triumphs over judgment. See how you get judged by others. Tell you right now, if you put that up on Twitter, Christians will jump on you. I know that. <laughs> What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds. And I'll show you my faith by my deeds. Yeah. Civics. There are responsibilities now. We're a transformed community. John agrees with him in 1 John. Uh, and I'm going to run out of time before I want to run out of time. But in 1 John chapter 3, uh, verses 14 through 16, he warns us 
the love of God is not available for people who shut their purses when compassion is called for. It's radical. Yeah. It's culture threatening. Yes. But so was freeing of slaves, and so were decisions to give people equal rights, and so is the decision to free ourselves from classism, racism, free freedom that we no longer judge. We no longer judge the world. We don't judge individuals in it. We're free from the tyranny of possessions, the tyranny of guilt, free in Christ to be simply Christian. When John Wesley was told that his house had burned down, he responded, the Lord's house burned. One less responsibility for me. Wow. He and Bobby are going to get along in heaven. This is not Marxist or liberation theology or any of these others because those don't measure up to Christ's teaching and the apostles' doctrine. We don't force it on anybody. We certainly don't want it to be forced by governmental decree backed up by guns and tanks and laws. But if we fail to live up to our teaching, we fall prey to being taught by the world. When we became the cultural norm back in the day, the culture normalized us and our power vanished. Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12 and elsewhere teaches us that our very bodies belong to each other, not to ourselves. We are and should remain a cross-shaped community, reaching toward God and then reaching out toward each other. As our safe harbor continues to grow bit by bit all over the world, it's fascinating to watch. Podcast listenership is down. Viewership of, uh, of sermons and such is, is up. And so it just grows. Let's join together. Let's open our eyes for the opportunities already given us. I would ask you to try this. No longer pray, dear Lord, I've heard this phrase so much, open up to us doors of opportunity. Instead, pray, Lord, open our eyes to the doors that have been standing open for a long time and help us go through them. Help us create a culture that stands apart from the world while still in the world. Let us become a community that doesn't just say great things, but lives them.